Hi! What I would have liked to do today is to give you a review of gameplay of Napoleon 4th Edition. This is a game that is on Kickstarter right now. Well, the old edition, uh, the old editions have been around for quite some decades. The game was originally published in 1974. In one form or the other, it has been around since. That tells you how successful the game has been. And now we have a 4th edition that has been uh, placed on Kickstarter. Now, the publisher has been nice enough to send me a prototype, which you see here, um, and I wanted to give an unpaid uh, preview of the game. I haven't been paid to uh, make this video, um, but I wanted to try the, pr the, the prototype, I wanted to try the game before it came out, and maybe uh, to share some information with you in case that maybe I'll help with you in case you're still considering whether you should back this new edition of the game or not. However, uh, in the last couple of days have had several mm, unforeseen events happening. I uh, haven't been able to play the game nearly as much as I wanted to. I really do not feel comfortable giving, uh, giving you a general mm, review of the game, telling you about gameplay and what I think about it. But what I can do is to give you an overview of the components and then an overview of the rules to tell you how the game works. Again, I do not feel comfortable drawing general conclusions about gameplay as uh, it emerges from those rules, but I can tell you the main concepts and rules of the game. And again, not what I wanted to do originally, but I hope this can be uh, still of some help to you in helping deciding whether to back this project or not. Okay, components. Well, this is a prototype, but the final product should not look too different. Just some things will be changed here and there and the components probably will be improved and when I'm thinking when I'm saying that I'm thinking about the map. The map here is printed on paper but in the final product the map will be mounted and it is a very large map which is really good because I've read that some of the complaints about the previous editions was that the map was too small and, and the board could get a little cluttered with blocks being everywhere. This should not be as much of a problem now and the map really looks nice. Here we have uh, two orders of battle that you can use to organize your blocks before the game starts. The blocks, the blocks are of high quality as they have been in recent years in games by Columbia. They are thick, uh, the corners look they have been clipped. Labels are pretty traditional Columbia block game labels, very functional but also thanks to one of the Kickstarter um, stretch goals that has already been unlocked, the game will also come with a sheet of, uh, of, of labels printed on this metallic type of, of paper here. So the blocks will look more military, more sci-fi, I do not know, you'll, you'll, you'll judge it. I, I like I like the way these labels look, very different from uh, any other label I've seen in Columbia Block games. Uh, well, I guess that you can still choose uh, to use the old ones if you so wish. The game should also come with a tactical uh, display that used to resolve battles when a battle of some uh, entity, when a battle of a certain size happens on the board, you remove the blocks from the board and you resolve the battle on the tactical display. Small skirmishes do not need to have that, uh, but the tactical board did not come with my prototype, maybe, I don't know was forgotten when the prototype was assembled, but it doesn't matter because I can still tell you how combat works uh, without the tactical display. This is a block game, that means that units are presented by wooden blocks that stand upright on the board, they are flipped face up like that to reveal the, the, the unit only during battle resolution, otherwise the blocks are usually facing the owning player. That means that the game creates a degree of fog of war because you know where the enemy blocks are but you do not know exactly which unit corresponds to uh, which block. Players alternate taking turns and uh, the active player first uh, goes through a movement phase so he can move his blocks, then the active player resolves battles and then uh, during the French uh, turn only there's also a supply phase in which, the, in which the players check to see what the situation is for the, uh, for the allies in terms of supplies, the French player can cut allied supplies and then you have to see whether one or two players has won the game or not. 
but movement phase first. Each player can move up to two groups uh, per turn for each movement phase. A group is any number of blocks that is present in a single location. Locations here are cities or towns. There is no maximum limit to the number of units that you can have in a town, but there are row limits. That means you can have all of your army in a single location, but then when you activate that group for movement, you can move only eight up to eight blocks on a major road per turn and up to six blocks on a minor road. Blocks that are activated for movement usually can move by one location, they can move to an adjacent location. However, some blocks such as cavalry, like this one, but also uh, horse artillery and leaders, these blocks can move up to two locations uh, per activation. You can also force march your blocks, so that means that the that you can move your blocks by an extra location. However, uh, that's risky because there is a 50% chance that your block will take damage. Uh, when, when you resolve the force march, you really die. There's a 50% chance that your block that you force march will lose a step. Blocks have a certain amount of steps which is recorded by the number on top of the block as the block is standing. That means that, for example, this block right now has three steps. If that block loses a step uh, because of a force march or in combat, then you turn the block by 90 degree to record and show the new amount of steps. When a block has only one step and the last step is removed, then the block is eliminated from the game. And there are blocks that represent leaders that can improve your chances of force marching effectively without losing steps. And also these leaders will improve morale, morale of your units during combat. Each battle of medium size or larger is resolved on a battle mat that has this configuration here. It is divided in two sections, one per player. Each section is divided in a right, center and left area. And each section also has a reserve. One player, of course, deploys on one side of the middle line, that deploy on the other side. To attack you need to have at least three blocks because you need to have at least one block in the left, center and right area. This is crucial. Actually battle goes on until either one of the players entirely retreats from the battle or an army routes which happens when one of the three sections of the battlefield is left empty. If the center disappears from here then the red army here will simply have to route that means the army retreats and takes attrition. Steps are lost. That is bad. Uh, and if you're attacking an army, an enemy, an enemy group, and the enemy group only has two blocks, then that is a skirmish. And those blocks, the two blocks that cannot stand a battle, have to leave and they take pursuit fire. That is bad too. But suppose a battle is happening because we have a situation more or less such as this one with blocks in all three areas and maybe even some blocks in reserve. Then, each battle turn has uh, three phases. The first is battle morale. You need to check morale for your one-step unit that are engaged with the enemy. That means they are adjacent to enemies. Um, and if they fail, they have to retreat. And there are cases in which retreating because of a morale check may eliminate a block. Combat is resolved in a quote-unquote traditional way. Well, there are elements that you have seen in other Columbia block games. One such element is that attacking blocks roll a number of dice equal to the number of steps that they have. And they score a hit on an, an opponent uh, for each number that is rolled that is equal to or less than fire fact they are the fire factor of the firing block uh, and also the block of the opponent that has to take the hit in case there are multiple blocks that can be targeted is the strongest block these are things that you've seen other columbia block games however in other columbia block games you do not get to move your units from area to area of the battlefield which you can do here in fact the during a uh, your combat turn, you could move a block instead of using the block to attack. In other Columbia block games, the order in which blocks attack, and that means, quote-unquote, represents, quote-unquote, the position on the battlefield, that is strictly determined by initiative number. Here, blocks can move. You could move, for example, 
if your blocks are unengaged, well, an engaged block could move from left to center, center to right, right to center. That means they can move parallel to the line of enemy units. If a block is engaged, and to engage, you basically cross the middle line and you move adjacent to the enemy that you're engaging with. If a block is engaged, then it cannot move parallel to the enemies. It can only disengage and then it will be able, that block, to move in other directions too. You can move the unit from your reserves to any of the wings of your army. And each turn that the block does not attack, the block can move by one space unless that block is cavalry and then cavalry can move up to two spaces. The other modifications that add flavor and that take into account the unique capabilities of the units, for example cavalry has a bonus when attacking but only the first turn in which that Cavalry unit is engaged to represent shock combat. Artillery doesn't need to be engaged with the enemy, it can fire at enemies on the other side of the middle line, uh, but if it is firing at enemies that are engaged with it, then that unit gets a bonus. Also, artillery cannot uh, willingly engage, it can be engaged, which is how uh, an artillery unit may end up being in the same area as an opponent unit, and this is how that artillery unit can get a bonus when attacking. Infantry units can declare a square instead of moving and that puts them in a condition that gives them advantages and disadvantages. Uh, as you can imagine a square defends particularly well against cavalry units but it is particularly vulnerable to attacks from artillery and it has a penalty when attacking. After the combat phase in which your blocks are moved or fired on the battlefield you have the reinforcements phase during which the active player can bring in reinforcements from adjacent cities, adjacent locations on the map. There are restrictions, road limits, but this is something that can be done. And again, it has more flexibility here than the other Columbia block games in which the schedule of reinforcement is much more strictly organized before the battle starts. After the combat phase, you have the LA supply phase, during which, in the French turn only, you check to see if the French player is occupying any of these cities. These are supply bases for the Allies, and they will lose units if there are French units occupying those cities. And, well, the game continues pretty much like this, turn after turn, um, movement, combat, uh, ally supply, there are night turns during which you can move but not attack, but in any case the game continues like this until uh, the end of the game as determined by the turn track or until one of the two players manages to achieve immediate victory. There are different ways to to win, a good one is to defeat enemy armies. Uh, the armies are defeated when they're reduced to a certain amount of points or less. The French player will win if they occupy all allied supply sources at the end of a turn or if both allied armies are defeated. And the allies have several ways of winning the game, for example by eliminating Napoleon or by uh, defeating the French army or by uh, simply by surviving until the end of the game. That is, if the French do not win before time expires. Here ends my video about the prototype of the fourth edition of Napoleon, the Waterloo campaign. I wish I had more to share, more ideas about gameplay, but I don't, so I cannot just make them up. Uh, I don't think that would be fair to you. I still hope that this video uh, maybe was of help to you in case uh, it helped you decide whether or not this is a game that may be for you, uh, whether or not to back the game on Kickstarter, the, the fourth edition of Napoleon, the Waterloo campaign is available on Kickstarter right now, not for many days, maybe you're watching this video after the Kickstarter campaign uh, has ended already, but maybe you're curious about the game and you're thinking, uh, maybe it's a game I want to purchase when it is published, well, I hope that this video gave you some information that may help you make in your decision. If you think this is a game you want to to help uh, during the Kickstarter project that by all means, you know where Kickstarter is, you know how it works, then all you need to do is to go there and back the project. For me, today, this is all. Thank you for watching.